The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H. P. Lovecraft Part 5 A Nightmare and a Cataclysm Chapter 1 And now swiftly followed that hideous experience which has left its indelible mark of fear on the soul of Marina Spicknell Willett, and has added a decade to the visible age of one, whose youth was even then far behind. Dr. Willett had conferred at length with Mr. Ward, and had come to an agreement with him on several points, which both felt the alienists would ridicule. There was, they conceded, a terrible movement alive in the world, whose direct connection with a necromancy, even older than the Salem witchcraft, could not be doubted. That at least two living men, and one other of whom they dared not think, were in absolute possession of minds or personalities which had functioned as early as 1690, or before was likewise almost unassailably proved even in the face of all known natural laws. What these horrible creatures, and Charles Ward as well, were doing or trying to do seemed fairly clear from their letters, and from every bit of light both old and new which had filtered in upon the case. They were robbing the tombs of all the ages, including those of the world's wisest and greatest men, in the hope of recovering from the bygone ashes some vestige of the consciousness and law, which had once animated and informed them. A hideous traffic was going on among these nightmare ghouls, whereby illustrious bones were bartered with a calm calculativeness of schoolboys swapping books, and from what was extorted from this century dust, there was anticipated a power and a wisdom beyond anything, which the cosmos had ever seen concentrated in one man or group. They had found unholy ways to keep their brains alive, either in the same body or different bodies, and had evidently achieved a way of tapping the consciousness of the dead whom they gathered together. There had, it seems, been some truth in chimerical old Borelis, when he wrote of preparing from even the most antique remains certain essential salts, from which the shade of a long dead living thing might be raised up. There was a formula for evoking such a shade, and another for putting it down, and it had now been so perfected that it could be taught successfully. One must be careful about evocations, for the markers of old graves are not always accurate. Willett and Mr. Ward shivered as they passed from conclusion to conclusion. Things, presences or voices of some sort could be drawn down from unknown places as well as from the grave, and in this process also one must be careful. Joseph Cohen had indubitably evoked many forbidden things, and as for Charles, what might one think of him? What forces, outside the spheres, had reached him from Joseph Cohen's day? and turned his mind on forgotten things. He had been led to find certain directions, and he had used them. He had talked with the man of horror in Prague and stayed long with the creature in the mountains of Transylvania. And he must have found the grave of Joseph Cohen at last. That newspaper item and what his mother had heard in the night were too significant to overlook. Then he had summoned something, and it must have come. That mighty voice aloft on Good Friday, and those different tones in the locked attic laboratory. What were they like with their depth and hollowness? Was there not here some awful foreshadowing of the dreaded stranger Dr. Allen with his spectral base? Yes, that was what Mr. Ward had felt with vague horror in his single talk with the man, if man it were, over the telephone. What hellish consciousness or voice, what morbid shade or presence, had come to answer Charles Ward's secret rites behind that locked door? Those voices heard in argument. Must have it read for three months, good God. Was not that just before the vampirism broke out? The rifling of Ezra Whedon's ancient grave, and the cries later at Portuxet, whose mind had planned the vengeance and rediscovered the shunned seat of elder blasphemies, and then the bungalow and the bearded stranger, and the gossip and the fear. The final madness of Charles neither father nor doctor could attempt to explain, but they did feel sure that the mind of Joseph Carwin had come to earth again, and was following its ancient morbidities. Was demoniac possession in truth a possibility? Alan had something to do with it, and the detectives must find out more about one whose existence menaced the young man's life. In the meantime, since the existence of some vast crypt beneath the bungalow seemed virtually beyond dispute, some effort must be made to find it. Willett and Mr. Ward, conscious of the sceptical attitude of the alienists, resolved during their final conference to undertake a joint secret exploration of unparalleled thoroughness, and agreed to meet at the bungalow on the following morning with valises, and with certain tools and accessories suited to architectural search and underground exploration. 
The morning of April 6th dawned clear, and both explorers were at the bungalow by ten o'clock. Mr. Ward had the key, and an entry and cursory survey were made. From the disordered condition of Dr. Allen's room, it was obvious that the detectives had been there before, and the later searchers hoped that they had found some clue which might prove of value. Of course the main business lay in the cellar, so thither they descended without much delay, again making the circuit which each had vainly made before in the presence of the mad young owner. For a time everything seemed baffling, each inch of the earthen floor and stone walls having so solid and innocuous an aspect that the thought of a yawning aperture was scarcely to be entertained. Well, it reflected that since the original cellar was dug without knowledge of any catacombs beneath, the beginning of the passage would represent the strictly modern delving of young Ward and his associates, where they had probed for the ancient vaults, whose rumour could have reached them by no wholesome means. The doctor tried to put himself in Charles's place to see how a delver would be likely to start, but could not gain much inspiration from this method. Then he decided on elimination as a policy, and went carefully over the whole subterranean surface, both vertical and horizontal, trying to account for every inch separately. He was soon substantially narrowed down, and at last had nothing left but the small platform before the wash tubs, which he had tried once before in vain. Now experimenting in every possible way and exerting a double strength, he finally found that the top did indeed turn and slide horizontally on a corner pivot. Beneath it lay a trim concrete surface with an iron manhole, to which Mr. Ward at once rushed with excited zeal. The cover was not hard to lift, and the father had quite removed it when Willett noticed the queerness of his aspect. He was swaying and nodding dizzily and in the gust of noxious air which swept up from the black pit beneath the doctor soon recognised ample cause. In a moment Dr. Willett had his fainting companion on the floor above and was reviving him with cold water. Mr. Ward responded feebly, but it could be seen that the mephitic blast from the crypt had in some way gravely sickened him. Wishing to take no chances, Willett hastened out to Broad Street for a taxicab and had soon dispatched the sufferer home despite his weak-voiced protests after which he produced an electric torch, covered his nostrils with a band of sterile gauze, and descended once more to peer into the new-found depths. The foul air had now slightly abated, and Willett was able to send a beam of light down the Stygian hole. For about ten feet he saw, it was a sheer cylindrical drop with concrete walls and an iron ladder, after which the hole appeared to strike a flight of old stone steps, which must originally have emerged to earth somewhat southwest of the present building. 